Hello, welcome to Washington Talk. I'm Young Gil Kim. South Korea's Moon Jae-in administration continues to push for the declaration of the end of the Korean War. While staying tight-lipped about the possible end of the war declaration, the U.S. Biden administration keeps calling on North Korea to return to the talks, adding that it has made specific proposals. Today, we'll discuss these and more. Joining me is Robert Manning, Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council. Mr. Manning spent 15 years in the U.S. government. He was Senior Strategist to the Director of the National Intelligence and served at the Department of State on the Policy Planning Staff. Patrick Cronin is also with me today. Dr. Cronin is Asia-Pacific Security Chair at the Hudson Institute. He spent more than three decades in the U.S. government and think tanks. He formerly served as Senior Director of the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. Thank you for your time today. Good to have you both. Happy to be here. Thank you. South Korea's National Security Advisor, Seo Hoon, visited Washington, D.C. to meet his U.S. counterpart, Jake Sullivan, in an aim to further discuss South Korean President Moon Jae-in's earlier proposal of declaration of the end of the Korean War. The White House or the State Department never really gives a straight answer to reporters' inquiries about the proposal of an end of war declaration. Mr. Manning, how is the proposal of an end of war declaration is received in Washington? Well, by itself, it's not very well received. But I, I have to say, this is not a new idea. It was it was pursued in the six party talks, uh, and I know the Trump administration uh, considered it as part of their uh, symmetry. Um, but the point is, by itself, it's just a piece of paper. It's a statement of intent, and it, and it has to be combined with a process of uh, a peace process and a denuclearization process moving in parallel. So it's not a question of for or against, it's a question of the context. And and I think that's that's the U.S. reluctance to agree because I think there's this ma magical thinking that if we just do this suddenly it will launch a new era of peace and prosperity and it's just not true. Mm. Dr. Cronin, after the meeting between Sullivan and Saul, a South Korean official said that the U.S. side's understanding of the necessity of an end of war declaration has deepened. Uh, do you think this indicates that the South Korean diplomats had to make extra efforts to make their U.S. counterparts understand this? Well, it certainly sounds as if the Moon administration is trying to uh, convince the Biden administration of something it's not so eager to do partly for the reasons that Bob Manning has laid out. One, everything has been tried before, this isn't really new, and it really has to be part of a more comprehensive package for looking at both peace and denuclearization. You know, half of the art of diplomacy is to say nothing, especially when speaking, it's been said. Uh, and I think here, uh, you know, the national security advisors of the two countries getting together, wanting to preserve goodwill uh, for their leaders, their principals, our two presidents, uh, is still very important. So. Um, at least they're talking about a common strategy. Mm -hmm. About this end of war declaration, Mark Lambert, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Japan and Korea at the State Department, said the U.S. and South Korea disagree on tactics, and that's not a surprise. Dr. Cronin, how apart are the U.S. and South Korea on this issue? Well, I would listen closely to uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Mark Lambert, but recognize, uh, your viewers need to recognize, there is a division of labor even at the State Department, right? So um, Mark Lambert deals with our allies, uh, South Korea and Japan, and it's really Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Jung Park and her uh, role as deputy to our North Korean Special Representative Sung Kim, uh, who make the North Korean policy. So. I don't think there's any state or U.S. government division on these issues. They don't see a lot of value. They don't see a lot of hope, really, in this singular end of war declaration making some kind of breakthrough. So I think that's counter, uh, countered by others in the administration, maybe at the Pentagon, 
who fear that it could actually weaken deterrence without actually making any strides toward denuclearization. So the point here is that, you know, the U.S. and the ROK may not be uh, exactly aligned, but at least they're not working against each other and they're determined uh, not to let North Korea exploit our differences. Mm -hmm. Mr. Matty, how do you expect Washington and Seoul to narrow their existing differences? Well, I, I, I think the U.S. is exploring ways to start some sort of dialogue with North Korea. Those South Korean concerns will, will undoubtedly be part of, of a package uh, if and when talks move forward. But, you know, I'll, you, it takes two to tango. And so far, North Korea has been playing some uh, intriguing games, partly aimed at dividing the U.S. and South Korea, and partly aimed at pressing the Biden administration to begin talks on its own, on, on North Korean terms. So we'll just have to see how that plays out. But as, as Mark Lambert said, there have been a number of options thrown out to the North Koreans, and they haven't really, you know, they haven't really responded. You know, they, they, you know, if they were serious, they could have said, forget denuclearization, we're willing to talk about arms control. That would at least give the United States something to decide. But they're, it, it, they're all classically ambiguous to try to maximize their leverage. You already seemed like uh, very skeptical about the effectiveness of the end of the war declaration. A lot of people, some people say it's mostly symbolic. Do you think it is only symbolic? Do you, don't you agree with the President Moon Jae-in's view that it could lead to denuclearization? No, by itself, it's just a piece of paper. Um, it's, it's like declaring, it's like the kellogg brian Pact declaring the end of war. It doesn't mean anything. But having said that, being in, I was involved in the six party talks and two of the working groups. And, and the end of war declaration was seen and discussed with North Korea as the beginning of a, a peace a, a peace treaty process. and But it has to be in parallel with progress on denuclearization. And, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's really not realistic to think that if, you, if we just make this statement, so, somehow North Korea is going to say, oh, great, here's my nukes. And it's not going to happen. Right. Dr. Crony, do you believe this could lead to denuclearization of North Korea as President Moon expects? It's hard to imagine. Uh, I think the chances have to be very low. I think actually winning Squid Game would be easier than uh, making this into denuclearization alone. But that doesn't mean we can't take steps forward. And I think here we have to differentiate between um, expectations of radical change and the possibility of opening up some diplomacy that could eventually be uh, fruitful. Right. Uh, meanwhile, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's latest speech grabbed attention. He gave a speech at an exhibition of its ICBM and other advanced weapons. There he said, uh, North Korea's enemy is war itself, not a certain country or forces like South Korea and the U.S. Earlier in January, Kim Jong-un said their biggest enemy is the United States. Dr. Cronin, has Kim Jong-un's view changed? Sadly, I don't think so. I think the long arc of history and even the 10 years he's been in power uh, at the pinnacle of power in North Korea suggests he's committed to his nuclear weapons program. At the same time, he's seeking sanctions relief. So he wants his cake and eat it too. Um, and he wants to have parity with the big powers, and he wants to make sure that South Korea is its biggest advocate for uh, assistance. So I don't see any real change here on uh, Kim's part. Right. Mr. Manning, what do you make of what Kim Jong-un said about the enemy? Well, I think he's trying to project the idea that all of North Korea's um, supreme weaponry, or whatever he called it, um, is not aimed at, start, at winning a war, but is aimed at strengthening deterrence. And the fact of the matter is we've been in a state of mutual deterrence with North Korea for a long time. But my guess is by, by talking about that the way he did, he, he may be singling 
that he's interested, you know, that a, a, well, number one, he's not going to give up his nuclear weapons, but that he's willing to discuss some sort of nuclear freeze or arms control process because his goal is to be like Israel and Pakistan, to be accepted as a nuclear state and treated as a normal country. That's been his goal, and that would be one tactic to, to get there. Mm -hmm. Mr. Manning, do you think that's why Kim Jong-un said the enemy is war itself? I mean, how would you interpret that expression? Yeah, 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 yes, I think if you go, that's it, it, it's reminiscent of the kind of Cold War where both sides had to had to uh, find a way to coexist, and that's kind of what he's hinting at, I think. All right, Dr. Cronin, do you agree with this, uh, Mr. Manning's view? Uh, yes, I do. I mean, Kim wants to keep his diplomatic options open, but let's be clear: uh, the United States and U.S. alliances with South Korea and Japan are his main targets for his nuclear arsenal. Um, Kim, though, understands risk, right? I mean, the State Department last week revealed that the United States officially has 3,750 nuclear weapons. Um, you know, Bob Manning said we're in a state of uh, deterrence. We are. Um, and as rational men and women, we should all have a healthy fear of war. So I think Kim is also expressing a reality that deterrence exists. Um, he's not going to give up his nukes, but he might be willing to deal with us uh, on his terms. All right. Dr. Cronin, uh, so we shouldn't read too much into what Kim Jong-un said about the U.S. U.S. is not the enemy. What do you think? Well, uh, I think he thinks we are the enemy, um, but that doesn't mean he can't deal with it. I think he probably thinks everybody outside North Korea is an enemy of, of, of one stripe or another. Um, uh, he has a fairly dark view of other countries and other peoples. We have a history as well, a history of distrust. So. It's not a big surprise. I don't think that's the relevant question here. Um, I think the relevant question is, is he willing to take some diplomatic steps that would actually improve security for North Korea and the region? Right. But you don't think he's, he's making enough efforts for diplomacy? Well, from a U.S. perspective, he's not making enough effort, and it's going to fail in terms of uh, trying to achieve a diplomatic breakthrough, from my perspective. Right. Uh, the State Department spokesperson, Ned Price, and earlier even Jen Psaki, at White House uh, spokesperson, they said the U.S. has made, uh, in fact, specific proposals to North Korea, and the U.S. will await a response from North Korea. Dr. Kroni, what kind of proposal do you think the U.S. has made? Well, if I could answer that question, I'd probably be on a different television program right now. Um, I, I really think the proposals are... Uh, pretty basic. Um, it's about opening up channels of regular communication so that the two sides or three sides or more can sit down and start to explore steps that each can take to reciprocally improve the situation. Um, you know, the, the calibrated practical approach that the Biden administration has, uh, you know, uh, put on the table uh, is a careful one. It, it has said it's unconditional about wanting to talk to North Korea but it doesn't want to make any concessions before it hears about possible concessions from North Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Manning, what do you think, what's your guess about these specific proposals that U.S. has made? Well, there, there are several possibilities. One might be, might be process-oriented. How do we do the talk? Should it be bilateral? I know there's been some discussion of reviving the six-party talks. Uh, so th those, that's one area. Another one is, you know, North Korea always talks about uh, incremental, step-by-step, action-for-action. And I, my sense is the Biden is, is prepared to proceed on that basis. But there, there has to be some, some basic principle to start the talks. What, are we talking about denuclearization? Are we talking about a peace process? Are we talking about arms control, and, and that's not clear. And the, the odd thing is, if North Korea is serious, what, what is so difficult about sitting down unconditionally with the U.S. and laying some of these ideas out? Because so far, I think the Biden administration has been very frustrated because they can't get a straight answer in response to the, their suggestions. All right. Mr. Manny, why do you think North Korea is not responding? 
as uh, Dr. Cronin said, I think he's trying to maximize his diplomatic options. So he's the hotlines with with uh, South Korea, hints of a North South summit, and and this latest, as I said, su suggestion to me that he's pointing towards some kind of nuclear freeze arms control discussion as the as the point of diplomacy and that the u.s would have to make a decision whether it's prepared to go down that road or not mm -hmm. mr manning is north korea waiting for sanctions relief is that why they're not responding that's that's part of it is maximizing his leverage you to, to see if he can get uh, something for nothing, which is a long-standing North Korean tactic. And, and also, where do we start from? Is it, the, it was, do we start from where we left off in Hanoi? Is the young beyond complex on the table? Uh, those are those are the kinds of questions I suspect that the Biden administration is, is, is putting forward to, to North Korea. Mm -hmm. Dr. Cronin, you don't expect the North Korea will respond anytime soon, do you? Well, we never know about uh, when North Korea responds. It seems to choose its own time. It seems like it feels, uh, you know, Pyongyang is in charge really of this calendar, but it, it has to be concerned. The Moon administration goes away next spring. There'll be an election coming up. So if they don't move quickly to try to accept some opening, then they are going to miss this opportunity and they'll have to wait until a new South Korean administration gets ensconced uh, late next year or in the middle of next year by the time it's really ready. Um, and so they'll have lost a, a, a good part of a, a period of the Biden administration and who knows what's happening in U.S. politics by then. So if North Korea wants to have that freeze that Bob Manning hinted at, and, and, and that's a plausible goal that North Korea could want as a, a temporary goal, um, they're going to miss the, even that opportunity to, to talk about it. Right. Uh, in the U.S., there's some criticism on how the Biden administration is approaching the North Korean issues. Uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell said Pyongyang is putting on another master class in how despots disdain the so-called rules-based international order. Dr. Cronin, do you think this criticism is just a political attack, or do you think there is more that can be done about North Korea? Well, it is political, but it's more than politics, too. I mean, remember, uh, Mitch McConnell is the minority leader of the Senate. He is uh, an institutionalist who's trying to make sure that his Republican senators, um, nearly half the Senate, uh, is united to show strength. Uh, but that show of strength is not really at odds with the Biden administration or with most Democrats uh, in the Senate either. Um, there's no real vote for making unilateral concessions to North Korea here uh, so a hard line in North Korea is actually good election politics, but it's also uh, reasonable policy at the moment. I, I think you have to remember that his remarks were made in the wake of a series of missile launches, the rail-mounted ballistic missiles, the long-range cruise missiles, the hypersonic glide vehicles, you know, all of those built to overwhelm expensive defensive systems. So I think Americans of both parties agree with the, the tenor of his remarks, but they shouldn't. Uh, that doesn't stop diplomacy from trying to move forward. All right. Uh, Mr. Manning, your view on this? Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I don't think there's a there's no there's no North Korea lobby in Washington, and I, I think there's pretty much a bipartisan cons some consensus uh, that North Korea is a menace, and we're not going to make unilateral concessions. And don't you know? You, we you shouldn't forget we have 25 years of diplomatic failure. Uh, going in dealing with North Korea, so this is this is not a new problem. And I think you know my own view is that all problem Americans tend to think that all problems have solutions, and there are some wicked problems that can only be managed, and North Korea may be one of those. All right. And my last question, just a short question. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the U.S. is prepared to turn to other options if nuclear diplomacy with Iran doesn't work out. Mr. Manning, do you think this could be applied to North Korea as well? I, I don't know what they would be. It's, uh, I'm not sure what he was referring to. I, I don't think anybody's thinking about uh, military options. Some people would like to tighten sanctions, but I, I, I'm afraid that uh, both Russia and China are not 
are not in a in a mood to 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 cooperate on that front. So I'm not sure exactly what our options would be. Mm-hmm. Dr. Cronin. Yeah, the major similarity between Iran and North Korea for U.S. foreign policy is that the United States wants a diplomatic solution, but in both cases it has limited leverage and maneuvering room. The main difference between these two is that with Iran, you actually had 158 more pages of a detailed plan of action on how to proceed on denuclearization. Uh, The Singapore Declaration is less than a page, and it really leaves us wide open still about what do we do with North Korea. And the UN General Assembly elected the United States back to the Human Rights Council more than three years after the Trump administration quit. And this move is widely expected to motivate the U.S. to become more vocal about North Korea and its human rights record. Mr. Manning and Dr. Cronin, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you so much. And that does it for this week's Washington Talk from Voice of America. Please join us again next week for more analysis. 